welcome to the Hack of the Hermit series. I'm Jason of Kingfisher Leaf Culture. If you haven't already, head over to kingfisherleafculture.com and download my ebook. It's called Roast Your Stogie Like a Yogi. So this is the Hack of the Hermit series. This is part one, the prereqs and practices for mastery of the microcosm. The, this is gonna be the first video of the series. Uh, by the way, at, at the end of the video, I'm gonna go ahead and, and demonstrate what I'm smoking and drinking today. So stay tuned for that as well. And uh, key number one is aspiration. So you have to know what you want and you have to want it really strongly. This is aspiration, but it can get in the way, so we're gonna talk about how to transmute that. So what do we want? What we want is we want to aspire to adepthood. So we're unlocking our magical potential. In these videos, we're gonna have the seven keys for unlocking our magical potential. Key number one is aspiration. Without this crucial key, you won't get very far at all. You won't, you won't stick with it. We're aspiring to adepthood. An adept is somebody who is a master, who has mastered concepts and practices and, and now they can teach it to others. That's the goal. That's how good you wanna be at this stuff. So you want to become a master, an adept. So adepthood, how do we get there? You have to access something that I call the will of the magi. This is the part of yourself that is immovable. And sometimes we accidentally access this in life when, we, when maybe the universe pushes us into a really uncomfortable position. The fires of life sort of push us, they get hot enough, and we're like, you know what? No. And we find this part of ourselves that says no, or maybe says yes, and we really mean it, and there's nothing you can possibly do to change our mind. That's the will of the magi. The will of the magi is harder than sapphire. It cannot be moved. You, you need to carve out a path that, um, is, uh, th that gives you direct access to your will. And you need to know exactly where it is and how to get there. And so how do we do that? We do that by doing things we don't want to do. And you need to do it every day for at least three weeks for it to begin to, to be a habit. So that you know exactly where it is and you know exactly how to get there at will, if you will. That's what you want to do. You want to get at your will. So one thing that you can do is you can take a cold shower every single morning and every single night. And every time you do it, you'll have this thought in your head, don't do it. It's going to be uncomfortable. And what you do is you say no or you say yes to the cold shower and you do it. And you do it. And not only do you get in there and not just for a second, but you... Ah, you surrender and you stand there in your strength with your feet planted on the ground or in the shower and you own it. That's how you do it. And you do that again and again and in spite of the mind saying, don't do it, this is going to be uncomfortable, it'll never go away, but you do it anyway. That's how you do it. For you gym rats out there, maybe you're going to find this at the gym. Maybe you're going to find other things that you can do in life. And that's the whole point. Find ways that you can integrate building a path to your will. And this is one of the ways that we build um, aspiration. Another thing that we want to do is we want to bathe in bhakti. Okay, bhakti is desire, devotion. Now this is this is where it gets a little complicated, so I'm going to clear it up. In in the East, you'll hear this idea, especially in Buddhism, the Four Noble Truths, and even in uh, in different uh, spiritual paths such as Hinduism, you'll hear this idea that the cause of all human suffering is desire. So. It, which is it? Which is it, Jason? Is it that desire is something that we should we should be building up, or is it that desire it gets in the way and you got to get rid of it? So yes and yes, and this is the difference between bhakti and tana. So the word tana, when the when the Buddha says that desire is the root of all suffering, we're not we're not talking about bhakti. We're talking about something that is um, better better translated as lack or as scarcity or as clinging, grasping, which is always reduced to fear. So, sorry, I have, I have uh, succulent gnats trying to land in, in my nose, so that's gonna be fun. You guys have those? Let me know in the comments. So, so you gotta learn the difference between your bhakti, your desire that you're building up. Another way to say it, though, is, is that you're transmuting your desire. So, as the alchemist of your inner world, you're actually transmuting these lower desires into higher desires. And um, another way to say it is that you're redirecting energy. So you have all this energy building up, this uh, sensation, and you use it, you channel it into what, into what you want to do. 
you know, which is unlock your magical potential and master your microcosm that you are. Um, another way to, to think of it is that you're building up your bhakti, you're, you're burning away your tana. This is the fire of desire that's been transmuted. It naturally does that. It builds and it burns away the fear that's there. Um, so that's why we say bathe in bhakti. Every day, you can't skip a day. You have to do this every single day if you want to build up this key that is aspiration. You have to remember why you want what you want and you need to build that desire, cultivate that desire because you won't stick with it, I promise you. You will not accomplish unlocking your magical, magical potential. You will not become the magician that you're meant to become if you do, you, you do not build up your desire. You won't stick with it. You have to want to meditate. You have to want what you want if, in order to sit there for 20 minutes again and again, day after day, you know, whatever your spiritual practice is. But so we're aspiring to aid up to accessing our will, doing things that we don't want to do so we can carve out direct access to our will. We're bathing in our bhakti every day, remembering why we want what we want, touching the part of ourself that's hot and on fire with desire, right? And then the third thing that we want to do is we want to charge up contentment. This is super important. This is actually how we transmute the tana into bhakti. So we actually charge up contentment, which is wanting it lightly. And this is how we engage the most powerful law in the universe, the law of attraction. Sometimes spiritual practitioners will describe the law of attraction in really simplistic, um, convoluted terms saying that um, as long as you want something bad enough, you build up that desire, you'll, you'll, get, you'll get it. You just have to want it bad enough. You have to believe that you'll get it. That's actually not true. That's not the law of attraction. Like I just described, you can overnight, you can slip from bhakti, devotion, into tana. This is how the ego very subtly hijacks our spiritual practice. You don't want that to happen. So in order to do that, you want to charge up your contentment every single day. And this is where our walking meditation practice comes in. So this is, I'm going to prescribe this as a walking meditation. It's very effective. And it's, it's, it's effective in the same way that when you do a sitting uh, mindfulness meditation and you tell the monkey mind, hey, watch the breath. And the mind goes, okay, I'm breathing in, I'm breathing out. Ooh, squirrel. You're like, no, back to the breath. Okay. And you just direct the mind that way because you're not the voice in your head. So you, you tell the voice in your head, hey, I want you to focus on something. And he goes, okay. And he does that, just like a mantra. You give him a mantra, say I am as you breathe in and out. I am, and he just does it again and again. And while you're doing that, you can observe that function. You can observe the mind doing that as the awareness that you are. See, you shift that identity, sinking deeper and deeper into the pure bliss consciousness that you are, that wise self that lives inside your heart space, that's you. This is, where, this is where it begins. You build up contentment. Contentment is the opposite of clinging. It's the opposite of tana, grasping. Oh, I need that. It's, this is how the ego hijacks our spiritual practice. You're like, oh, I really, really want that. I really, really want that. Yes, I need that. Oh, why can't I have that? Oh, I really need that. See how I, see how I did that there? I went from desire to desire. It wasn't good. I slipped into lack. I started feeling frustrated. See? You can't, you can't do that. And if you're not paying attention, you will do that and you won't even know it. That's why you always transmute Tana desire into Bhakti desire. Transmutation, transmutation um, is just a circular process that never ever ends and you will never ever need, uh, you'll never cease to need this key of aspiration. It'll always be a part of your practice that you incorporate into the seven keys. Charging up contentment, wanting it lightly, because if you want something too strongly, you're gonna slip into lack mode, grasping for it. Just like um, enlightenment, you, you, you wanna become enlightened, it's a wonderful desire. You wanna become your best self, you wanna be better. You wanna achieve all that you're meant to accomplish in this lifetime, and you want to make the world a better place. You wanna be a, a bright, shining beacon of clarity, you know, to all that are in your sphere of influence. This is, these are beautiful intentions. The ego will hijack them in a second if, you're, if you don't stay awake. So that's why you don't want to slip into wanting something so strongly that you need it and you can't have it and you're, you see what I'm saying? No, no, no. Do it the way Jesus prescribed it. Hey, do you want to have abundance? Go ahead and vibrate with it. Even if you don't know where your next meal is going to come from, be so thankful that you have all that you need now 
And that is what you do. So this is how the walking meditation goes. You wanna be fully present, just as you were in your breath, This, except this time you're gonna apply that, excuse me, apply that principle to your, your legs. So you're gonna feel what it's like to be in the left leg as you step. And you're gonna, you can do this indoors if you have space to do a walking meditation. You don't really need that much space. You can do it outdoors. Some people love to meditate outside. I argue that you don't want that to be a factor in your meditation. Yeah, own your space. Yeah, light some candles and, and do, you know, create a nice space and create a ritual and a routine, but ultimately don't rely on it to the point where you can't meditate without it, that you need to be outdoors to meditate or you need to have a candle lit to meditate. But, but yeah, create a ritual out of this and it doesn't matter whether you're indoors or outdoors. What matters is you're fully present in, in the left foot, you're fully present in the right foot, and you're being here now. And as you're doing that, you're gonna use a couple of mantras in that you're gonna tell the mind to say something, and you're gonna tell it to mean it. And you're gonna say thank you is the first thing you're gonna tell it. Because when you say thank you, and you don't even have to know who you're thanking, it. thank you, the you doesn't matter, it's not the point. You could be just, Delete you know, that need to know who you're thanking. If you're thanking God, if you're thanking your mom, it doesn't make a difference. The mind doesn't care. The body-mind complex doesn't care because when you say thank you and mean it in your heart, you vibrate with it. That's the point here. So thank you, thank you, thank you. And try to mean it a little more each time you say it. And, and, and let that, um, the energy of gratitude fill your body. Let it fill each leg as you, um, almost like you're sinking into the earth as you, as you step firmly on the ground and you're becoming um, um, clarified and purified in your desire, in your intention to be grateful. Yes, is the second thing I want you to say. So, uh, so you can combine them, you can interchange them, but you need, it doesn't matter how you, you say these things, but I want you to say thank you and mean it with every, every cell in your being and I want you to say yes. And when you say yes, as you're walking, you're saying yes. Yes to all that is now. All the things that you can't change, you say yes to those things as context for your creation. You say yes to all of the good things and all the bad things because the truth is there aren't good things and bad things, there's only things that, you know, um, because the mind, there, your thoughts about things are the only thing that gives um, an experience its positive or negative charge. So. The mind thinks it knows. The mind isn't, isn't your wise self. It thinks it knows, but it doesn't. It'll say things like, that shouldn't have happened. And it'll say things like, that should have happened. But the truth is your mind doesn't know what should and should not have happened to you. So that's just mental activity that, that, is, not wis that is not wisdom at all. Access your wisdom that basically, not only does it see everything as neutral, but when you sink into that deep sense of peace, that all is well, there arises this overarching goodness. That's the result of, of accessing your, um, your clarity of mind that you, that you have from identifying with your wise self that lives in your heart space, okay? So when you do that, you're gonna have clarity of intention and you can use this as, the. I think the walking meditation is, is a great way to integrate this and you can do this because you walk. You have legs that get you around throughout your day, whether you're walking through a parking lot or walking from one room to the other, you're walking to your kitchen to get a drink, like whatever you're doing, you're walking and you can say yes, yes. And as you do that, you're burning away resistance, resistance, because you have to be in a state of allowing for this stuff. You wanna access the law of attraction, you wanna, you wanna like interface with the universe and get what you want, First, you have to vibrate with it because the law of attraction isn't you get what you want, it's you get what you are being now because a human being is an action verb. So whatever you are being now, you're gonna get more of that. That's why you need to go ahead and vibrate as if you already have what you want. See, that's, how, that's the key. Most people miss that. And they'll talk all day long about, make videos about the law of attraction. They have no idea. It's not that you get what you want, it's get what you are. You get what you already are. So you're a, you are an action verb, what are you being? And here's the coolest hack I ever discovered. You get to, to decide who you're being now, today. And if you don't like who you were being yesterday, you can reinvent yourself. You can be different today. As 
an action verb. You can be different today. And if you don't like who you were today, you can be different tomorrow. You can experiment. You, If no one's ever given you permission to experiment with the human being that you are now being, you got it from me, buddy. Do it. Experiment with who you're being. Change. You can not only change your beliefs, you can change your habits. You can create new thoughts, new thought forms, new, new um, thought patterns and neural pathways. And, but it's deeper than that. You can actually alter your vibration because everybody has a dominant vibration, which is basically our default way of being. You can change that. You can actually raise your dominant vibration and it's not that hard. It just takes you actually taking seriously what I just taught you in this video. And you can actually raise your dominant vibration. If you practice every day, you will default to gratitude. And that, when you, when you do the work to get to that place where your default way of being in the world is just a sense of gratitude. By the way, it's the exact opposite on the spectrum of victimhood, the victim illusion. Even if you've been victimized, you still get to choose whether or not you're, you feel like a victim, whether or not you think like a victim, you see. Whether or not you identify as the character in the story called the victim because you're gonna vibrate a specific way that creates more victimization because whoever you're being now is what determines what you're a magnetic match for and what the universe is gonna give you more of. Get it? That's how the law of attraction works. I promise you, it'll work for you. But you gotta do it this way. You gotta do it from the inside out. You, can't, you cannot trick the universe, by the way. You cannot fool the system. You can't pretend like you really wanna do the right thing you can't do the right thing for the wrong reasons. You have to get your shit together on the inside so that you're already vibrating with it. And then you'll be a magnetic match to what you want. And what you want, again, is adepthood. You wanna be a master, you wanna unlock your magical potential. And you want to achieve mastery of the microcosm. That's the goal. The first key is aspiration. You have to aspire. And you have to bathe in bhakti every single day and you want to turn this into a walking meditation you can obviously do it sitting and standing you can do it anyway i'm just prescribing it in a particular way because i think it's really helpful and i think you should try it and let me know in the comments what you think if you try it as a walking meditation let me know and if you try it as different meditation let me know how that goes too and we can compare and we can um, fine tune this thing and really get it um get to where um you know, we can, we can offer it to people in, in the best way, but this is key one, key number one. Charge up your contentment, want it lightly. You're gonna transmute your scarcity into gratitude, engaging the law of attraction, interfacing with the universe, and just, just without any effort at all, you're going to be the magnetic match for what you want. My friends, I promised you at the end of this video, I would show you what I'm smoking and drinking today. Thanks for sticking around. This is the uh, Pappy Van Winkle Family Reserve. These are barrel fermented cigars by Drew Estate. Uh, really delicious. You got the giant Pappy here. You know, this is um, if you've ever had Pappy Van Winkle bourbon, it's um, it's really special. This is what the cigar looks like, and uh, take it out of the wrapper here. Oops, I just broke off the t the uh, pigtail. <laughs> That wasn't a, yeah, let's see. So, ah, man, it's okay, I got another one here. But yeah, it just broke up, oh, there it goes. So this is what it looks like with the pigtail on it. And you can see it's beautiful, beautifully made cigar. You light, you barely have to even light the tip of it and it continues to burn the wrapper because it's tapered. This shape is called the flying pig. Drew Estate um, is, was inspired by the classic cartoon um, version of a cigar, which is this, you know, fatter in the middle, tapered on both ends, and just like, you know, the, the gangster cigar from, you know, 20s cartoons or whatever. That's what they wanted to, to um, create a cigar that looked like that. And um, so that's the flying pig shape. It's a great smoke. Anything in the flying pig shape is gonna last like an hour and a half to two hours. It's a short little cigar, but it is, it, you can't underestimate this cigar because it will, it will last. Um, you have the Pappy emblem on there, and um, what you'll notice about this cigar is the smell. This thing is the smokiest smelling cigar you'll ever smell. It smells 
um, a friend of mine said, and he hated it, and he said it smelled like skull. Like you ever had um, dip? Some people like to dip, put tobacco in, in their gums. Um, so he thought it smelled like that. What it does smell like is burnt wood, um, char. And so it, this thing, when it first came out, got a lot of mixed reviews and a lot of negative reviews because people didn't like it. And I think the more that you uh, smoke these, the more that you really start to appreciate the complexity. But um, it is smoky on the nose. And, and even I, I was a little bit afraid to put this in my humidors because I didn't want to make all my other cigars smell smoky. But then once it grew on me, I was like, you know what? I wouldn't even mind if they all started smelling smoky. But it hits you on the nose just like my drink, which um, this tea that I have is from China and it's called Lapsang Sushong. And it's, this is my uh, Choi Abed mug. But um, the tea is absolutely the smokiest tea that you'll ever try. And um, it, is, it is made by smoking um, pine wood. So the smoke of the raw leaves are processed as um, they can do a cold smoke or hot smoke. But um, the flavor and the aroma of Lapsang Shushang is, is described as containing empyromatic notes including wood smoke, pine resin, smoked paprika, and dried longan. Um, so it's really, really smoky. They go together. Like if you ever get a chance to try Lapsang Sushong, I don't think I'm saying it right, sorry, I don't speak Mandarin or whatever language that is, but I can tell you it's a delicious tea that really pairs magically with this smoky cigar. So. If you've ever tried the Pappy Van Winkle Family Reserve Barrel Age Cigars, let me know in the comments, um, whether you've had it in the flying pig shape or any of the other shapes that it comes in. And if you've ever had the Lapsang Suchong Cigar, or um, tea rather, let me know if you've had that. And if you've ever got a chance to pair these guys, man, you'll know it's, it is spot on pairing. It's a, it's a wonderful match and it's just, um, it's it's nose candy man you're just on the nose on the nose and it's just wonderful um obviously when you light it you're gonna have the char of the actual cigar that's gonna overwhelm anything you were smelling on this cigar when you before you lit it and when you did the dry draw you're gonna have pretty much it's gonna overwhelm and you're not gonna be able to smell that char anyway but um it's subtle actually i, I believe that i still can when i um when I puff on it, but but it, but at first I, I I thought it went away altogether. Now I think that it st sticks around, but it's uh, more subtle. So that's my demonstration of uh, what I'm smoking and drinking today. Um, the next the next key is going to be awesome, so stay tuned for that. And um, thank you, thank you for being here on the other end. And uh, I think you guys are going to get a lot out of this. This is the Hack of the Hermit series. Um, Part one, prerequisites and practices for achieving mastery of the microcosm. This is gonna be awesome. So uh, stay tuned for the next video.